Good afternoon, and welcome to the Global Landscapes Forum digital event, GLF Live. My name is Natasha Elkington, signing in from Nairobi, Kenya, and I will be your host and moderator for today's compelling discussion on an ancient grain, one that has been cultivated by humanity for over 10,000 years and is on the brink of disappearing, which will be a tragedy for crop diversity and humanity as a whole. 2023 marks the International Year of the Millet, also known as Sri Anna in India, meaning the mother of all grains, but unfortunately has been cast as a minor crop, but hopefully today we will find out why the magical millet is anything but minor. So joining us, we have two experts um, on the millets and the millet grain seed. We have Dr. Crispus Odiori, based here in Kenya, who has over 34 years of experience researching and managing um, millets. And joining us from Northern Ghana, we have Chef Wisdom Abiro, who has a culinary passion for highlighting his community's wisdom, health, and food styles in order to strengthen food security and climate resilience. So please join me in welcoming our two very interesting speakers. And I think, and just to begin the discussion, we'll just jump in and ask um, Dr. Crispus Odiori to share with us a brief history and summary of the, this, this millet grain where I, we can learn a bit more about it. So why don't you share with us, Dr. Odiori, about the millets? Okay, thank you, Natasha. You know, when I talk about uh, millets, we are referring to over 12 different species of plants that belong to the grass uh, family. And among these, uh, you know, they are uh, archaeological evidence suggests that uh, these originated somewhere in Africa, but they have spread across uh, continents and uh, they, are more, they are very important now in uh, uh, Africa and Asia. Uh, uh, going by their origins, they have got uh, a lot of cultural importance in the areas that they are cultivated. And what is marvelous about these millets is that they are the most, the, the, the earliest domesticated, among the earliest domesticated crops uh, in uh, humanity, but yet to date, they are least cultivated. These uh, millets, the millets have got uh, a wide range of advantages. They have got a wide environmental adaptability. They are resilient in adverse uh, environmental in terms of uh, climatic, biotic, and the defic stresses, they are nutritious. More so in terms of minerals, calcium, for example, is one very important uh, element that is found in, uh, in, in millets. Have fiber, they are gluten-free, they contain antioxidants and the essential amino acids. Generally, because of their small size, they have got very good storability. They have got high traditional and commercial value. And therefore, they have potential even in commercialization today. And I think uh, the reasons why uh, the, 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 the FAO and the United Nations thought that uh, they declare this year the year of millets is because they have come to realize uh, the value that these uh, crops hold, and yet they have been in neglected. They have potential for investment, and uh, they are therefore, because of the lack of attention that they have received, they are at risk of uh, getting extinct. And therefore, it is important that uh, uh, the FAO and the UN decided to focus on these crops. We hope that it will bring attention, well-led attention for intervention. Briefly, that is about uh, the millets. Thank you. So, what, but why has this? Why is it being neglected? I mean, let's start there. Like, what if it was an essential part of our diets from long ago? What what happened? I think uh, what has happened. What happened is that uh, in the first place, it is cultivated in areas of uh, low economic capacity. Uh, and therefore, there is limited knowledge on the value of the crops. There has been limited investment in research and development. And uh, we have not even collected all the germplasm that is there. The climate change effects are aggravating the situation against millet. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, we need to intervene. I think the intervention probably will start coming in a force after this 2023 year of the millet. But we need to get back and do something about it. Great. And and as this um, year of the millet, this 2023, maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Chef Wisdom Abiro, uh, have you seen, like in your cooking, I, I think you did also another video I saw um, before on like promoting millets. 
how is this year, has this year had any effect on how we handle millets, <laughs> um, in your opinion, by giving it this 2023, um, the year for it? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the GLF um, for this opportunity to be on set with you and uh, to talk about millets. Uh, I am very passionate about things that come from um, my region and um, millets as a grain that is being highlighted by the FAO this year. And so um, talking on this is, is very, very important to me. And thank you again for the opportunity. And so um, millets, uh, like said by Dr. Um, Asian grains that has been in my culture and in other parts of the world for a very long time. And um, I mean, the introduction of the year of millets by the FAO has greatly contributed to the awareness of people about the grain. So uh, people are asking questions about it. People want to know about it. People um, seem to have seen it some time ago, but they didn't know what they actually are. And so um, declaring this year as the year of millets um, has helped tremendously to um, introduce the grain to a lot of people. <clears throat> and so uh, it, I, I am happy about the initiative and I can see the progress it has gained this year. Great, thank you. So Dr. Odiori, I mean, you've been studying millets for 34 years. Like you're, I guess, <laughs> might be the millet expert of the world um, right now. In, in your experiences, what, is, what has been the big challenges um, uh, you faced here when it terms in terms of you know your research and your and management of millets. I think the challenges have been mostly due to limited resources in the areas that they are cultivated, in that uh, there is uh, very little invested in the research and the development of the value chains of millets, and thereby implication even uh, by extension the personnel, qualified personnel allocated to the improvement of the millets is not there. And therefore you find that the value chains are not growing. Uh, people are still using millets the same way they used to use them long time ago. And, uh, that is not helpful to the millets considering the world in which we live today. So we need technological investments, uh, research and development investments to get the millets up to standard, up to the pace of the, uh, uh, the exotic crops that uh, came came on board and helped kick them out of uh, uh, out of uh, uh, focus. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, so, how do we? You know, like as I know, um, recently we've had superfoods like you know, like the chia seeds and quinoa and different grains that were also kind of dis disappearing, which are now um, very appealing. Um, how how do, how how can we make millets kind of join this this bandwagon of you know interesting appealing foods? Maybe a bureau you can join in there. Yeah, so um, just like with initiatives like this that was introduced by the FAO, we need to um, start up by creating more demand for it. You know, the more we keep having conversations like this, uh, and I'm really excited that um, GLF is, has taken this upon them to put this out. These are some of the things that we do that would help um, um, create more awareness. We need to keep talking about it, talking about the health benefits, talking about um, the creative and amazing ways that it could be incorporated in our diets. And that would um, draw a lot of awareness. Because one thing I realize is that demand is something that um, directs the, the movement of things in this world. You know, so um, because the, all of a sudden there's demand for quinoa, Quinoa is eating everywhere because there's demand for barley. Barley is eating everywhere. And so um, when we start to drive the demand for millets, um, types of millets, um, like fonio, all the other types of millets, that's where it starts from. It starts from we getting the demand. And how do we get the demand? We create the demand by having constant conversations, you know, uh, putting up agendas, um, um, bringing up like challenges, like millet challenge, things like that to like incite people to keep talking about it. Once people start talking about it, the demand will be created. And I think um, it will go a long way to uh, bring the minds of investors and researchers to it because it's like where everyone's focus is, that is where um, the resources go. Yeah. Great. And I, and I know you, I mean, on that, on that note, you created a really cool video for us, to, like for recipes to show us uh, 
how how to use millets in different ways. And I think like now would be a great time to maybe just give yeah. maybe introduce the video a bit for us and tell us about it, and then we'll we'll queue it up. All right. So um, in uh, in the short video, I wanted to show the two ways in which I use millet, and uh, and from where I come from, northern Ghana. Um, we uh, we have the pearl millet, pearl millet and sogum, but pearl millet is more popular and, and very, very indigenous and you can find it everywhere and in, in my region. And so um, in the video, I'm showing two ways of using the pearl millet. One is to make a, a local indigenous drink called zonkum or the millet drink. And then uh, two, I'm making uh, an indigenous quick meal or fast food called um, konkore. But um, because of um, pronunciations, I, I, I have renamed it and call it the millet cake. And so uh, okay. the millet cake is like, um, in, in, in back in the days, it, it was considered the fast food because it can be made in less than five to 10 minutes. And um, mm -hmm. it's just, you, all you just need is your pearl millet, but usually it is parboiled. So that makes it easy to cook because it's like, it's already half cooked. So you just need to, um, cook it a little bit and it's done. And all you need is like your pearl millet, your um, vegetable stock or any kind of stock you have, um, your seasoning, and that's it. So it comes in the form of a risotto. So this is more of like oh, nice. a millet risotto. Yeah. So that's um, like the simplest way I'm able to introduce it to people because it, it goes, the preparation is just like a risotto. And uh, the amazing thing is that to get it more indigenous, you need to cook it with the shea butter. And uh, that also helps me to introduce a lot of these things that come from my indigenous community to people. Yeah. Beautiful. Great. Thank you. So I think on Thank that you. note, we'll ask her to cue the video and let's see uh, Chef Wisdom Abiro's uh, interesting ways of uh, using millets. My name is Chef Abiro and these are the two ways I use millet. I'm going to be making a millet drink called Zonko and these are the ingredients. Our cloves, our grains of Salem, our grains of Paradise, our dried spicy pepper, local black pepper, coconut shavings, some honey for sweetness, shea butter for flavor, and pearl millet. The ultimate millet we'll be using for this recipe. To make this recipe, it is quite simple. All you need to do is put in your millet, add in your coconut shavings, add in your cloves, um, your grains of Salem, the grains of paradise, your dry pepper, your dry um, black pepper, your honey for sweetness, your shea butter, and your generous amount of water to blend it all up together. We are done with our millet drink, Zonkong. Try this recipe at home anytime and join the Year of Millet Challenge. Two, the second way I use my millet is to make something from my indigenous community called Kunkore, but I call it the Millet KK. So to make the Millet KK, all you need is your um, pearl millet, parboiled, and crushed so once you're done parboiling it you spread it out for it to dry and then you crush it a little bit then you need your vegetable stock and then you need your chopped um, garlic chopped onions you need your shea butter you need your powdered cayenne pepper and salt to taste and you're good to go Yes, 
uh, and so this is our millet KK in my indigenous hometown. This is called Konkore, and I call it millet KK. So our millet KK is ready. Remember, this is made under five to ten minutes, easy and quick. Make sure you always have the part that has the shea butter because shea butter makes everything better. Right. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can I tell you, I didn't know you could cook with shea butter until just now. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah uh, just, I, it's, it's basically what we use in cooking in, in the northern part of Ghana. So uh, we cook with shea butter, we cook with our peanut um, butter oil and yeah. uh, any kind of vegetable oil. But these two are very indigenous to my people. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. You can smell it from there. Like I think what two things <laughs> that I, I caught from the video, which I thought were really... Um, Interesting is the one is that I think even for young people, because this is the issue today, yeah. is that we don't have time to cook. So if you yeah. have something that's nutritious and easy to cook, then it should be more appealing to um the younger generation, right? Yeah. And yes. then and then also this the the story about our indigenous um culture, bringing back the yeah. stories from our traditions. So like, I think I'll go to Dr. Oduay after, in terms of asking about Kenya, what's our history with millets? And see yours with Northern Ghana, you're bringing in the stories from long ago and you know bringing them today because it's important. So for me, these are the two things that I took uh, from your great uh, recipes. Um, so what, what do you think about that in terms of, you know, with young people, you know, with millets and uh, our youth? I think that's a very good combination. Yeah. Yeah. As in. So I, yeah. And uh, um, so one thing is that for a very long time, um, the use of millet has been limited to um, what is common in our, our society. And so um, they are basically maybe just two ways millets are used all around, especially from the southern part of Ghana throughout to other parts of West Africa, like Nigeria, um, it's, uh, in, in making a porridge called Hausa Koko. And so uh, this, uh, this, this porridge that is made from the pearl millets that originates from Nigeria down into Ghana. And so the southern part of Ghana only know that to be the use of millets. But um, when you come to the northern part of Ghana, where it is part of our culture, um, there are so many varieties of ways. We, we have um, indigenous pancake recipes. We have um, like the millet cake recipe. We have um, the zonkum recipe and so many others. We have a swallow that, um, that we make that is called tizet, um, that is known also in Nigeria as tuozafi, but ours is made from millets, but theirs is made from corn or maize. And so uh, there are so many um, ways millets have been used. But uh, one thing I've realized is that it has, it has still been used in the old way, no new techniques. And you know, um, for us in the Northern part of Ghana, we um, usually eat for strength and eat for nutrition because we are always in a hurry to get back to your farm. And uh, because, I mean, in, in the Northern part of Ghana, we have like just three months of rainfall. And so, um, you always want to seize the opportunity to be at the farm to make the most out of the season. And so uh, um, there is no time to make the meal beautiful. You only consume it for, 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 for strength and, and for vitality. And, you know, um, we are now in an era where people want to eat with their eyes. People want to eat something that looks beautiful. They want, they want to see how beautiful it is on the plate before they even think yes. about tasting it. And so um, that is what we are doing Um with the NGO that I work with, the Ghana Food Movement, looking at um, creative ways of reintroducing um, neglected or underutilized species like millets um, in, in modern ways and attractive ways to make it more appealing to the younger generation because millets are superfoods. They are amazing. They, they have uh, antioxidants, anti-aging. They, they help reduce your cholesterol, your blood sugar, so many amazing things. And so... Um, we need to find creative ways of making it appealing to the young people. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. That's and 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 I agree. And I think also, Doctor Odiori, you were showing us earlier um, uh, how like how available is this in stores? Like, if if people wanted to buy millets, and we you know we want to make it's the international year of the millet. How easy is it to find it um, in shops? So easy to buy it. And then I also know you created nine different varieties of millet. Yes, Doctor. Um, so yes. please tell us. Yes, so tell us about the availability and about the like. varieties we've created. <laughs> yeah, first of all, before we get there, I think uh, the, the story for millets 
in Kenya is yeah, almost the same as what Abiro has, uh, has indicated in Nigeria. Only mm -hmm. that uh, here in Kenya, well, the, mo the important millets are finger millets and then mm -hmm. pile millet. Pile millet to a lesser extent in the drier eastern parts of the country, but uh, uh, finger millet in the west, uh, west of the Rift Valley uh, parts of Kenya, spreading into Uganda. And the uses were also <laughs> limited initially because uh, they were used in three different ways. You know, first as ugali, as you know, that cake, the ugali, and then uh, uji. That is the most common way that we, we consume our finger millet or the millets. And then also uh, the traditional brew, the beer made from our finger millet. And coincidentally, you know, uh, literature tells us that uh, finger millet is only second to barley in terms of malting quality. So it has got a lot of potential in the brewing industry. So now, after the reawakening of uh, uh, interest in, uh, in, in the millets in Kenya, we are making quite some uh, strides. You know, we are uh, starting like uh, from uh, the production right up to the consumption. You know, we are covering the whole value chain. We have adopted what we call uh, the agricultural product value chain approach to research. And we are looking at each node to make sure that we remove all the constraints in there so that the value chains can grow and have more people eat the nutritious uh, millets. And uh, one of the products of that effort is now taken up by a startup company called Simply Foods. And these guys are processing this and getting them into the markets. And they even uh, supplying, they are getting orders to supply some of these to projects like the school feeding programs and all that. So, and when you do that, like uh, Abiro just indicated, once you increase the demand, then it means that now the, the demand will have the full effect and therefore bring everything up, you know, expand the value chain, expand the production, and even the consumption will expand. And this will assure uh, the citizenry of good health. As you know, finger millet is a very nutritious cereal. So we have made quite some strides. Now we have expand, expanded the utilization options, the food products. From just the three, now we have got over 10 products that we can talk of, you know, of the chapatis, you know, of the trackies, onion bites, and all that can be made from finger millet. So the future looks very bright for finger millet. And like you, uh, you have indicated, uh, rightfully indicated, my contribution has been on the production side of the story, where I picked from a point of where people had lost interest in the crop. They were only seeing problems. But with the development of uh, improved, better uh, yielding varieties and uh, uh, accompanying uh, management practices, uh, uh, practices to make sure that they can be easily produced, the interest is growing. And we are grateful to support from uh, 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 agencies like uh, the Crop Trust, who have given us resources and enabled us to uh, collect wild relatives from where we can get desirable genes to incorporate into the land races and the commercial varieties to make better yielding varieties with the desired properties. Great. So Thank I you. guess you know we're going to be ending soon. So I'll just stay with you, Dr. Diori, because you've been in the yes. you know for 34 years, you've researched this millet. And finally, 2023 has been declared this year of the millet. So um just yes. to ask you. Um, in terms of Pan African, like how are we sharing our our millet stories? Are we is is there like a, a continent wide um, like awareness campaign sort of going on where we're sharing all the knowledge that we have um, on the continent? And then I guess my second one would be is in India. Like I, I read that millet is also helping a lot of women farmers advance and you know supporting them more uh, than than usual than other grains. So do you just want to comment on that? And then I'll I'll come with Chef uh, Wisdom after. Yes, in terms of uh, uh, sharing inf uh, information across uh, the continent, you know, once uh, we got uh, uh, stakeholders on board, you know, we have had various organizations coming together, like uh, uh, CGs now have got interests. The consultative group on international agricultural research have adopted the crop, and now we are even creating networks across the continent to address where professionals are coming together and addressing the issues of finger millet. The most recent was uh, last week. We were in uh, Dar es Salaam with people from East and South and Africa just discussing millets and what we can do about the millets. That's already a very positive story and a very positive development. In terms of uh, the social uh, setup, you know, the crop values and all that, uh, finger millets. 
and the general millets have been considered a women crop. And I think uh, previously it was because the, the, of the labor intensity involved in, uh, in the production. So women, they knew, they, are, they, they acknowledged that the crop is very important and they are nutritious to their families because they needed to feed the nutritious foods to their children. So they invested more time in, uh, in, the, in the cultivation and the processing of finger millet and then uh, uh, making food for the families and the surplus selling off to supplement their diets. So it has for a very long time been considered a women crop. And when we build its value in the community, we are also building, uh, empowering women in terms of uh, getting more in terms of food and uh, pocket, uh, money in their pockets. So yes. it is uh, creating, it's getting on board what we call uh, gender equity. Mm -hmm. It's contributing towards that in our society. That's, 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 that's a great story. Um, I, I think, I, yes. I mean, I've learned a lot. And I, I hope our audience has also um, learned, learned a lot. And I think with uh, Chef Wisdom, I think for you, if I would ask you, it's, it's the story about our indigenous cultures. Because I feel like on this whole climate crisis, you know, um, it, I think we need to go back to the wisdom of our elders and our traditions. Even yeah. though we're moving forward, they, they had wisdom back then. There was, there was reasons for things. And I think, you know, like even connecting, let's see, like a chef with a scientist together, you know, bringing these two different worlds, which are not so different. These are also ways of, you know, um, enhancing this conversation and, you know, bringing it back. So maybe with the uh, chef, I, I guess my last question to you as we wrap up would be like, you know, just the, to maybe share with us the indigenous story, the story from your community um, and in your cooking, and especially here with millets, um, you know, your your closing thoughts. And then I... Yeah, so, uh, um from the stories I learned from my mom and, and my grandmother, there were times um, where, you know, from where I come from, it's always, like I said, we literally experienced like three months of rainfall, but mm. there was a time where in the whole year, there was no rainfall. And you know, that's one thing about millets. These are, they are climate resilient crops. And you see, these are the, these are the grains that still stood the test of time even when there was no rainfall, these crops were there. And um, from where I come from, we, we have um, the, the cattle herders and, uh, and the nomadic people that wear the cattle, the, the goats and the sheep. And so that is always considered like um, a male kind of activity to do. And then the, 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 the crop production, like the grains um, are handled by the women same in, in uh, as, as, as in Kenya and as in Ghana as well and so usually when the men go to the to the fields with the animals the children are left behind with the women and you see um and and typically in the African setting it's just breakfast and dinner that are the main um, um, um meals for the day um lunch is not really something that is considered because during the afternoon times it is considered that there is no one at home but that's when the use of millet comes in. It is quick, it is easy to make. And so these are like, these were the go-to meals that our, our grandmothers and our mothers used to make for the, for the family. You know, it's like when you come back from the farm, you're so tired. And I mean, from the whole day of stress, you want to rest a little bit and then think about what you want to eat in the evening. But before you relax, you are looking for something quick, something easy to make that could sustain you for that couple of hours. And millet was that go-to grains that, that really helped. And I mean, there were times where there were um, um, conflicts among um, like uh, smaller tribes. People wanted to take territories. The, the grain, the millet grains used to be like um, means of exchange. These were like peace settling grains. These are grains that literally brought peace between two communities because um, the fight and the conflict started because of hunger. And um, there were times where um, they decided that instead of fighting among themselves, they could just share the grains among themselves and then help share the food. And so um, these grains do not just come to us as food, but they have a lot of history. They've done so much for us that we could even imagine. And so uh, um, we celebrating millets this year, it's, it's a big thing. And um, it is my hope and prayer that it doesn't just end with this year, but um, we keep continuing the conversation. We keep stirring up the demand, you know, because 
um, in, in, in times where we realize that climate change is a big factor, these are some of the grains we should be talking about. You know, like um, in, in, in the case of the Russian and Ukraine war where it was so difficult to import wheat and things like that, these are things that we could have still look up to because we could bake with, with, with um, uh, the millet flour. Um, and, and we are also looking at a possibility where the, the millet varieties that we have in Kenya can come to Ghana. And the ones in Ghana can go to Kenya, can go around the African continent to make sure that these grains still stay and, and do not go extinct. So uh, I hope we still com continue this conversation and create um, ways where we could share the seeds and, and share this generational knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you too. And I think I think what you've also pointed out is that even what happened in our past and our history is basically what we're facing right now. I mean, there's hunger, yeah. rainfall, we have mm -hmm. very little rainfall. So whatever we're experiencing is something that our forefathers experienced then and found a way to survive. And yeah. so, you know, we should be taking these lessons from them, <clears throat> you know, to ensure our our future. Yeah. Um, we have learned so much. I mean, who would think that, you know, <clears throat> talking about millets for half an hour <laughs> would be like, you know, an interesting conversation, but I've learned so, so much um, yeah. today on, you know, how to cook them, the, the history of them. And I guess um, we actually have a comment from, from our audience, from Twitter, uh, someone saying that they grew up in southern part of Zimbabwe and yeah. we grew these small grains. And I have the opinion that there should be some mechanization to promote farming techniques. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Dr. Odiori, do you want to comment on on that, this this uh, from yeah, we are actually looking at that. Like I said, we are looking at the whole of the whole value chain, and that is mm. involves production right from the farm, trying to get machines that are easy to get, cheap to get, and therefore facilitating the whole process. And looking at it all through to processing, diversifying the utilization and all that. So I think we are addressing that one. Great. Great. So it looks like we've we've gone a bit over time, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, it's been a pleasure uh, and, and a really an, an, an education for me to learn about millets. I'm definitely going to go try to cook something with millets um, after this conversation. And I do hope, as you said, this just because it's the year of the millet that this that it's the year yeah. and it continues to be all the years of the millet where we bring it back in our, our diet. So I'd like to thank you exactly. both for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for keeping the conversation going and going. And uh, yes, we hope there's a good future for our millets. <laughs> yes, yes. And we recommend millets in your diet, Natasha. Yes, yes thank you. We're going to go and try and I'll let you know. And I hope that you you can also connect and collaborate with, yes, with, with yes. science and cooking and we can make you know millets more cool for everyone. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure, looking forward sure. to, yeah, looking forward to visiting uh, Kenya and uh, learning more mm -hmm. about the other and types yes. of millets and see how best I could. Uh, yes. yes. In, in, in Ghana here, I've tried to make meals that incorporate both the pearl millet and the sogum. And so I'll be looking forward to creating amazing dishes where I could maybe combine all the 12 varieties. Uh, all the, the 12 plate. millet millets, yeah, yes. I mean, give millet people, varieties, yeah. yeah, I mean, give people a dining experience of uh, the 12 varieties of, of millets. Maybe I would name it uh, the 12 wonders of millet, maybe. <laughs> Why not? We could have a series of our that's 12 it. wonders of millet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How it goes. But thank you yeah. all. Uh, I think that's it for our session. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll come back again and see where we've progressed <laughs> in our millet story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Good. Good.